So hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, clearly the paper in my hand states that I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, we are, I'm really excited to be hosting such a diverse panel. We are only nine of us, that's half the audience on the podium today. But um, I think the topic that we're discussing is something which is very, very relevant. It plays a very key role in uh, ensuring that your businesses have flourished and they deliver success in the ever-changing times. We're going to be discussing about adoption of agile marketing, uh, the need for a mindset shift. And uh, before I start the discussion, I want to understand how many of us in this room today uh, remember what the Zuzu ad was or the Jagore ad or which brand it belonged to? Anyone? Vodafone, correct. Uh, so I think what's, what's brilliant is even after so many years, these ads stay relevant to us. And who knew back then? Uh, we did not label it as agile marketing, but according to me, it's a fantastic example of agile marketing, simply because it speaks about reaching out to the right audiences at the right time. If we talk about the Jagore ad campaign, it was during the election season. Zuzu hit the cord with cricket. And they created a differentiator by striking a chord with emotions with their end users, right? Uh, to me, this is what agile marketing is all about. Uh, so keeping this in mind and the ever-changing landscape, uh, I'll move and I'll start the session by asking each of y'all, what, according to you, does agile marketing stand for? And more importantly, how is it different from traditional marketing? Uh, maybe you want to start? So I think the biggest challenge is not only the mindset, right? The, the thing is that most brands know what the customer does with them in terms of transactions. But there are no platforms that give you real-time insights of what the consumer is thinking today. So let's say, uh, one of our things in our platform was right that we identify trends, AI tells you why it's trending and how you can link your brand to it. But the thing is that most people know that transactions, but they don't know what cuisine they prefer or what they like wine or beer, they like comedy as a genre, action as a genre. So if somebody could create something which is real time, that helps as a base for all kind of decisions you take on media buying or creative strategy or content creation, influence selection, so I think the biggest challenge is data on a real-time basis to take these decisions. If we can solve that problem, then agile marketing can be better. Isha, you want to take it? I'll, I'll take in the cue from uh, the real-time piece that you talked about. And for me, when we hear agile marketing, it's all about responsive marketing. Yes, real-time. Yes, very nimble. But more importantly, I feel it requires a mindset shift. Uh, agile marketing, I also feel, is almost like an organizational structural change where you have to completely pivot yourself uh, from the traditional cues to the modern cues. It's so much about consumer interactions and what they think uh, over your documents and plans because you're re-gearing, you're reshifting. It's also so much about acting on the change than sticking to a plan and details. So for me, uh, agile marketing is uh, so pivotal, which requires so much of buy-in across the organization, otherwise it's a failure. Right, so that's, that's for me on Agile. So I'm a bit old school, okay? <laughs> uh, I think the role of marketing for me is to be able to add value to the consumers and customers that we work for, period, Agile or not Agile. I think for me what Agile really does is to be able to answer and be relatable and addressable to those needs quickly and faster. Also because the consumer needs are changing and evolving more and more with digital and more information. It also for me as Castrol, for example, means when COVID strikes and nobody's taking their bike and car out, how does an engine oil brand still remain relevant? And I'll probably talk about it later. So that's, that's really for me agile, customer consumer centricity at a much faster speed than what it used to be traditionally. So it's safe to say our consumer mindset first, then yes. the platform Cons or the consumer channel. Consumer first at everything we sense. do. Yeah. I think e-commerce brands and you know the young age D2C brands are built on the principles of Agile. So I'll just quote an example uh, specifically to our category. So lingerie used to be sold by you know in stores by retailers and they used to stock in two or three sizes or fits. So it used to be more of a push model than a pull model. So we, to solve that problem and you know to address that issue, we started production in small batch sizes of say 500, 600 units. 
and catering to various sizes, fits, colors, and varieties. Then based on the pro customer feedback, the iterative product process took place, and then we refined our product category. So the premise of our business has been agility, and that's how we, have, we are functioning. Sapna, what do you? You know, we are storytellers, so I'm going to start with a small story. When I started my career some 20 years back, uh, I came from an events background and I shifted to marketing. My then marketing had told me, you know, you have to do this campaign and I didn't know how to do marketing. So I asked her, I said, what do I do? She said, go figure. That was traditional marketing where I started figuring what to do. And agile marketing is where I'm still figuring. Yeah, because as an agile marketer, I need to keep figuring what my consumer wants, where he is, and chase him, speak to him wherever, whatever he wants, and still be connected to him. So yes, for me, agile marketing is keep figuring, keep experimenting, keep being in touch with your consumer wherever he is. That's such a lovely story. I think keep figuring, <clears throat> keep learning <clears throat> is something all of us should do. But for me, the difference between agile and traditional marketing is speed. I mean, all marketers keep consumers, customers at the center of what we do. But agile marketing to me is about listening to what the consumer says and giving your brand story in the way that they want to hear it, not the way that you want to say it. And I think to Isha's point, it requires enormous empowerment. It requires organizational buy-in because if 10 people have to sign off on an ad brief, you're not being agile. Let's be clear about it. So I'll talk a little more about how at MasterCard we try and do this. But to me, it's about listening to the consumer and giving them what they want to hear. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be in Mumbai. Uh, I'm Vanda. I work at Wowskin Science. And I come from Bangalore, which is the startup capital. And I think there's not a, nothing better than a startup which uh, embodies uh, agility. Uh, we don't have the luxury of time. And I really love what Sapan said, because that's what I live on a daily basis. I go figure. I've cut my teeth in legacy FMCG. And there we had the benefit of business cycles, right? Two, three decades where you learned over time. In a startup, you're figuring out your business model. Consumers are changing. Time is changing. Product is changing. In that heady mix, what do you do? And how do you get revenue is very, very important. And I think, yes, uh, Mansi, time is the essence, the quickness of speed. And uh, over the course, I'll give a couple of examples of how do we do and we grow. But I think Speed is very, very important, and measurement is key. Uh, consumers are changing, and therefore, if you have metrics in place before you start a campaign or you have a launch, and in real time, you can make changes to be able to drive that revenue, I think, uh, then you're home. So it's all about time, it's all about measurement, and understanding your consumer. Yeah, thanks. I have a slightly different take on agile marketing. Uh, many years back, I read a book which was called Fail Forward, Fail Fast. You know, and to me, agile marketing is about failing forward and failing fast. You know, can you keep on creating constantly new POCs, trying it out? Does it work for my business? Does it work for my brand? If it works, institutionalize it. If it doesn't work, throw it away and move on to the next thing. To me, that is really what is agile marketing. Thank you, and I think what what I take from this is that customer is key. Uh, you got to be open to change. Rigid does not work fast pace. And I think most importantly, we all need to be okay with failure. Keep trying, keep evolving. And measurement is very, very crucial. And you have to do that at each and every stage. Uh, I think taking cue from this, my next question would be, today with multiple advertising platforms, channels, formats, uh, it can become a challenge to adapt quickly while you want to ensure that you're staying relevant to your consumers, right? So how has having an agile marketing strategy helped your respective brands overcome this challenge? Uh, I'll start with you, Mansi, from a BFSI perspective. A, do you see this challenge? And if yes, what's the strategy that MasterCard has adopted to overcome this? Sure, thanks for that. And I'd like to see one marketer who doesn't have this challenge. We are living in an incredibly cluttered world. But I think the key, and I'll just sort of uh, take a minute to speak about MasterCard. So we are a payments brand, and we are a very behind-the-scenes payment brand. Because let's face it, all of us pay every single day with whatever mode of payment. We want it to be seamless, we want it to be safe, and we want it to be efficient. 
actually the, the success in this is not to think about payments because if you have to call up your bank or call up somebody, then it actually means we haven't done our job. However, the trick here also is to find out what are consumers really interested in and we are a multinational organization, US headquartered, but I think the great thing about this company is they've, uh, they've listened to people like me to say, here's what works in India. And to the point that I made earlier about understanding consumers and integrating your brand into what they want, uh, we've adopted a very India-centric festival first strategy. So as a simple example, Raksha Bandhan, all of us know it. It's a season of gifting. How do we tie up with an e-commerce player you know, on MasterCard to bring brothers and sisters together? That's telling the brand story at a moment where people are thinking about a sibling relationship. Um, so to your question, I think it's about first getting that consumer insight, acting on it. Yes, you will get it wrong at times, and that's where, Harish, to your point, the organization has to be willing to encourage innovation and get that none of us are Superman or Superwoman and therefore mistakes will be made. But then it's about getting the real insight. And once you get it, then tell it in an evocative way. Now, I know this seems a bit like motherhood, but I think that's really what it is. Uh, the insight is crucial. If you can find that differentiator, then you are absolutely home and dry. Yeah, and I think that's something that can be adopted across verticals. Absolutely. It doesn't limit it to just BFSI. Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Mansi. Uh, would be interesting to know, Sapan, how would this play for a very different vertical as yours, which is primarily mass entertainment? How do you see this challenge and how do you all strategize on overcoming this? So you know what? Uh, television marketing has seen a paradigm shift from you know, when I started back 20 years to now. You know, uh, we are a typical mass GEC brand and we cater to across categories of audiences, right? So it's not that I have a specific TG. Yeah, we are TG pans from the grassroots level who lives in the heartland to a niche person who's sitting, say, in a Hyderabad or a Bangalore or a Mumbai, right? And similarly, when our audience set is so vast, our marketing has to pan across to all those people, right? So we say that, you know, I like to say that while we are a mass general entertainment brand, but we actually look at our consumer in a very pyramid format. So right from starting from the grassroots level to the masses, to reaching out to that niche audience, we cater to all of them. And believe you me, we have to be agile enough to understand what language the consumer wants to talk to us to. Because the way I will talk to a woman of 45 years of age sitting, say, in an Anabad, will be very different from who, the way I will speak to somebody who is sitting in a metro and is very educated. So one will have to evaluate and see what one reaches out with, right? And the beauty about us is that, you know, I say that I I come from a land of snake charmers, literally, right? Colors as nagins and pisachinis of the world. Yeah, but the tune that we need to play to make them sway is not our tune. We have to play the tune that the consumer wants to listen to. Yeah, and that tune could be very different for everybody. And I will right now, you know, put something very straightforward here that while we talk of agile marketing, a lot of people mistake it as digital marketing. Yeah. Agile marketing is not digital marketing. Agile marketing is reaching to your consumer wherever he is. So, chahe I mele mein jau, ya main meta mein jau. So, mela to meta, that is the journey that I'm talking about. You know, I advertise a lot in Nochandi melas where people come with their families. You know, I'm engaging with them on a ground level. And at the same time, I have created a metaverse for one of my shows, Dance Devane Juniors, where I have created digital avatars of audiences made them interact with, you know, uh, our star cast and stuff. So that's the diversity and that's the agility of uh, agile marketing. Another thing is that as brands, we need loyalists. And how do we make loyalists is when we engage with the consumer on a very regular basis. How do you do that? You build communities. Now, building communities is also agile marketing. One way of building a community is where I have created a Colors Golden Petal Club where I I've created a loyalty program, and I'm engaging with the woman on ground. The other way to build community is social media, where I'm engaging with the consumer on a day-to-day -day basis. And today, I'll be very proud to say that we have somewhere over 80 million audiences uh, who are in touch with us on our social media platforms. So that's another way of agile marketing, where you are adjusting yourself to the needs of the consumer. Whether it is on ground, whether it is online, whether it is physical or digital. Merging yourself into a very digital world is what agile marketing for me is. You know, uh, 
back then when I started, you know, with, there used to be in influencers in small towns. You know, aapke panchayat ke log ho gaye. You know, somebody who's an influencer, key influencer in your city, whether it is a district magistrate and all. Today, the word of the meaning of influencers has changed, and how you interact with the consumer has become very different. Earlier, there used to be one big Bollywood star who was an influencer, and people used to listen to him. Today, they are micro influencers. How do you engage with these micro influencers who are sitting amongst your audiences, amongst your consumers? And how do you make them speak your language? On that vertical, you know, we built something known as Color Social Squad. We built our own community of influencers. We, went, we reached out to people across cities, got them on board. We make them interact with our stars. We take them on our sets of our shows. And you know, they talk about us. Rather than us tom-toming about our products, we've got these loyalists who now talk about our products. And they engage with the consumer on a daily level. You know, earlier we used to do one, two, three campaigns in a month or maybe in a year or so. Today, our campaigns happen every day. Every day through different mediums, we are actually engaging with the consumer and that to me is agile marketing. Whether it is catching on a viral trend or, you know, it is inviting a person. Say earlier we used to do door knocks, right? Yeah, we used to do leaflet distribution in audiences' houses. Today, we are creating augmented reality to invite people. We created an augmented reality video with Ranbir Singh where he was personally inviting you. So he, you had a video where it said, hey Mansi, I'm coming on TV tonight. Will you come and watch the show with me? I have created personalized invites. We have created anamorphic videos where you know the uh, digital avatars of our artists have interacted with audiences. Now that's what to me is agile marketing. And we continue to do so. And like I said that, what we need to do is we need to keep on unlearning every day and learn newer and newer things and be connected with the consumer at every given point in time. So like I said that, you know, uh, for me as a mass brand, I am reaching to dadi, chachi, kaki, nani, bittu, bubbly, all of them, right? But do I speak the same language to them? Do I, uh, you know, only reach them through TV, which is the mass media reach medium? No. I will talk to you in a mela, and I will also talk to you in a digital avatar. I will talk to you through my stars, and I will talk to you through micro-influencers. That, to me, is agile marketing, and I think that's the job of every marketeer to continuously engage with your audiences and be with them in every step of the journey. Awesome, and I think uh, what, what, that's quite the point that you said that for a mass entertainment brand, right from melas to augmented reality, right? You can't be picky and choosy about your platforms or the channels, but you have to focus more on your audiences and wherever they are, strike a chord with them. Uh, and if I may add a line to this, I think what's also important is wherever you're reaching out your audiences, you have to ensure that you're measuring it constantly. What is it and how much of it is benefiting you? What's the quality of that particular um, you know, space where you're reaching out your audiences as well? Because they're gonna be parking your revenues on it. I, I would just like to add something here, sure. you know, since you've been talking about measurement, uh, a lot of mediums that we actually deploy are not measurable. But does that mean that we stop engaging across those mediums today? Measurement of digital, sure, it's, it's questionable, right? The only measurable medium that you can have today is TV. Yay. But that doesn't mean that you will only go through TV. You will have to expand the scope of your interactions. So for me, it's not about measurement so much but it is about quality interaction with the consumer. Fair. I need to reach out to him, speak to him. Whether I can measure that eventually, it will end up giving me results. Maybe today it's not measurable, but at some point in time it will yield results. So the measurement is to me a little bit of a question mark here. Yeah, it depends again, like you said, right? Where you can, you should, and where not, you don't limit your scope to it. Perfect, so I think very recently we also ran a four fundamental shift report at our company. And we realized that there has been a huge shift in the buy pattern for shoppers uh, in the pre-pandemic and the post-pandemic era. Of course, we all have been uh, not just witnesses, but also victims to this increase in shift in the shopping. Uh, and an interesting number would be that actually it's highest among Indians at a whooping 74%. Um, so what I want to understand is, Nikhil, maybe if we get a scope on this from Clovia's standpoint, you guys are a relevantly new brand. I uh, want to understand if you've seen the shift in the consumer buying pattern for your vertical, and if yes, 
uh, suddenly with this pandemic era, how did you prepare yourselves in terms of agility to ensure that your teams are well prepared for this? So I think uh, I would like to, you know, break this into during pandemic and post pandemic. And during pandemic, all categories, you know, shifted to online. And we saw consumers buying rampantly online because one, it was the need of the hour. Second, more and more categories were available online. For Clovia, we saw exponential growth in loungewear and activewear. So, you know, because people were at home and people were trying to get healthier and also, uh, you know, fitness was a way of life people adopted, activewear sales zoomed up. But on the contrary, the bra sales uh, fell flat. So we saw a huge dip in the sales of bras. So accordingly, we had to, you know, adjust our working capital, deploy our production accordingly, deploy our marketing budgets from one category to the other as per the requirement of the business. While I say this, post pandemic also, we, uh, in 2021, we saw that surge of, you know, shoppers coming online. But in 2022, that surge has now plateaued. So people are back to the offline stores and the maybe I think it's the pent up demand or something, but I was just going to a data uh, few days back that 93% of India is still shopping offline. So while we have always been a online, you know, digital first brand, we are ramp, you know, ramping up our offline presence now. So right now we are at 65 exclusive outlets across the country, but in the next 12 months, we want to go to 300 touch points across the country. Now here also we are, you know, leveraging our, you know, knowledge of 140 million user data points and how we are leveraging it. For example, I have three point of sales. They can be SIS, EBOs within a radius of five kilometers. But I understand very well that, you know, a, a person in this locality is, you know, demanding a certain category of products, certain style, certain color of products. So those three stores within a, you know, radius of five kilometers will also have different products stocked in their stores. So this is how we are leveraging data to be agile and also keep our offline presence as buoyant as our online presence. That's quite interesting. Vanda, what's your take on this? At Bowskin Science, we are always an idea first company. I think what we did prior to the pandemic actually kept us in good stead to extract the maximum. So our agility comes from identifying trends. So what we do is we always keep an eye on search volumes. What are the ingredients which are coming up? Is it argan? Is it under eye rollers? Is it onion and black uh, seed oil? So our entire range, right? Our innovation is fueled with interesting formulations in great looking packaging, smelling wonderful, and you know, they are fantabulous formulations. So we had the entire innovation funnel set up what happened during the pandemic was that people couldn't shop. And over 80% of our sales anyways come uh, from online channels. So what we did during this time was we really cranked up our entire uh, uh, marketing engine. We go to nearly 4,000 influencers on a monthly basis. So what do these guys do? Because ours are new, interesting ingredients. They actually tell consumers how to use it, textures, usage results, etc., And this we can directly check on how our traffic comes to our channels. So we cranked that up. We saw an increased interest. We kept on fueling our campaigns. And then we saw huge uptake of all these interesting formulations. And I think during the pandemic, people were at home. They were willing to experiment. So that's the time we actually got into households. What happened post the pandemic is because sampling happened. People tried new ingredients and we are really confident about our formulations. Consumers loved it. Our retentions were all time high and people actually kept on buying it again and again. So post pandemic also we've seen uh, our curves have not uh, flattened and it has actually grown. And we continue fueling this in real time uh, to be able to grow. So I think a little bit about our innovation funnel also of how we are agile is uh, having worked in companies which take a year, if not more, for innovating a product where you get your entire mix right. In a startup, we are so agile, right? We have an idea. Uh, we know the formulation. 
And we don't wait to tick all the boxes. We launch MVP products. We isolate a geography. We isolate a channel. We launch it, and we see how the mix is faring there. We devote our monies uh, onto concentrated efforts. When we see the mix working right, we have increased confidence, and then we scale it to a wider geography, uh, and uh, you know, we introduce new channels. So this also helps us to uh, experiment and also tweak the mix along the way. So I think this agility, including uh, the tailwinds of the pandemic also, has really helped us to go to uh, increased our households by around 5x. Uh, growth also has come, and I think um, it's been a good time. Great, I think 5x is a remarkable number in such a short span. And correct me if I heard it right, you said 4,000 influencers in a month. Wow, that's quite an example of agile marketing. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean to say, um, so we do it different across different categories, cat A, B, C. And the beauty is we can actually track it. And because we sell on marketplaces, right, there is a mechanism to see how traffic comes, how your GVs increase. Uh, we track CTRs and ROAS very, very closely. Being a startup, right, everything comes in real time. Unlike, um, I was actually speaking to Asia and also UJIT about um, how uh, data comes in for you to take corrective action. If you're selling in brick and mortar stores, it's a lead time of at least three months before you, the data comes in and you can take corrective action. But for us, it's far more real time. So I think that's the beauty of how we actually operate. Yeah, correct. That makes a lot of sense. So I think so far, we all agree that digital is becoming an increasingly important channel across all verticals. I think let's address the elephant in the room. And I'm going to look at Vivek to help us answer this question. The post-cookie world. I think the post-cookie era is definitely fast approaching. And it's making it hard for brands to deliver and to also measure their data, which ultimately has an effect on the ads, right? So I know that your company, Profit Wheel, was built exactly for this reason. So can you help us understand how are you all helping brands overcome this? For someone like a D2C brand like a Clovia, how can you all help them prepare better for a cookie-less future? So I'll give you a given context, right? Most of advertising <coughs> used to always focus on sort of collecting data on a 1P basis. So you would enrich your CDP with one-to-one -one data. All the activation platforms, the advertising platforms took that away, right? So you could not target one-to-one -one anymore, right? GDPR, CC prevents it. And then cookies getting deprecated has suddenly created this void because now you don't know how you're going to understand your consumers. So when we started the company, we were very clear. We'll work with the genome of the best customers of the brands because that's what they know, right? So let's say if you would say Nikhil knows who their best customers are, how many times do they transact, which times, like what are the markets they come from, they're returning products or not, all this information is there, right? So if you could actually just take these cohorts and segments and upload into a platform like ours, right? So you can get the psychographics of that customers within seconds. So you know that these are your high value, this is a psychographic, these are your low value, this is a psychographic, these are people who return products, these are people who buy five times in a month, these are people who buy this kind of active wear, this kind of lingerie. So very quickly you understand the audience. So you understand people who buy lingerie, you understand your high value audiences, and this then actually helps you in a lot of decision making on a day to day basis, right? First of all, because it's on a cohort or segment basis, you can activate against it, right? You can get, okay, you want to build a community, this is psychographic, this is the kind of content you should create for that community. You want to choose an influencer, right? So I'll give you an example. I think this would be amazing for Anna. Like just imagine you have high value customers, you have an influencer. You take a psychographic of your high value customers, you take a psychographic of your influencers' audiences. And what if you could identify the overlap? So now what happens is that your influencer has a million followers when they post something, right? My daughter's an influencer. You have 1% organic reach. That means only 10,000 people will see that post. But you have, let's say, 50,000 people who are overlapping. What if you could actually boost the influencer's post only targeting the 50,000? So not only you reach 5x, but these are people who are similar to your high-value audiences. So the influencer is going to love you because you're adding more followers to her. But over a period of time, the influencer will become more and more effective for you because you're adding the followers that you would like to add to her, but they are your high-value customers. So I just believe that the, this has been a tailwind for us, both cookies and that. But I think the key is that intelligence platform should be used for things that we have not been able to guess for the platform. So it should be used for market research. It should be used for understanding consumers to even make changes in the product. Right? So if, if let's say I can give you psychographics of Victoria's Secret and Clovia, 
and if Victoria's Secret has a lot of affinity in a certain market, maybe the kind of products that you have that compete with them head to head, those should be launched in those markets. So just imagine that right? you can do this for every single competition. Like we have a trending tool where what we do is that every day we tell you trends on TikTok, Snap, Google, and, and YouTube. Then the AI helps you say, why is it trending? Can you link your brand to it? If yes, it also creates the creative. So our creative engine takes the psychographics of your best customers, puts it into a multimodal AI model of ChatGPT, Cohair, Bard, comes back, a comparison AI creates the creative construct for you. So what brief you should give to the agency as well as the creative. So see, our purpose is brand should give it to all the ecosystem partners. So when the brand licenses the platform, they should give it to the creative agency, give it to the media agency, give it to the marketing agency, give it to the consulting company, give it to the teams. So and because our reports, you can give comments, so everybody can come and collaborate, right? So the purpose is there should be one North Star. That North Star is our most profitable customers. And for that North Star, all the team should work instead of silos, collaboratively together to acquire and retain the most profitable customers we have, right? Because the bottom line of our company's profit wheel is that 20% of our customers give us most of our profits. But we don't know what they look like because of that aligning different departments of the companies and our ecosystem of partners towards that one direction become extremely difficult. So we, that's the problem we are trying to simplify. I completely agree with you. And I think um, the future holds the reality that brands and marketers will have to move away from cookie targeting. And they will have to start relying more on their persistent identifiers. I think that's where I see things going. And incidentally, at Double Verify, we've always had our solutions that never dependent on cookie targeting. It was more audience targeted and segment says understanding their behavior. Uh, Isha, your point of view, I think, because it will be a great um, learning for us to know. At NEPA, how do you guys ensure adopting an agile mindset will be able to help your brands drive growth through the learning that you'll have on data? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So I, I'll weigh in on a couple of terms that were thrown on the from the panel. Um, we were talking about cookie-less. And I think the cookie-less world has as much uh, posed a confusing situation for measurement, uh, but also I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, for us, if I double click on NEPA, we offer consumer research for agile, brave marketers. That was, that's what we say. But what is it doing? It's actually a great opportunity for us to have a shape, shift sort of form for market research at this point, uh, because every time we're getting an RFQ or a brief, it's followed by cheaper, faster, better wins, right? So what is Cookieless World really offering us uh, is a lot of sometimes budgetless, resourceless. So you're doing more with less. So when we are uh, giving advisory to a lot of our brands, it's coming in, what can I do now? What can I do with less? And that's becoming a very important part uh, for us. In terms of our mindset shift, uh, we are trying to democratize decision making a whole lot more uh, as an agency. That means not every decision has to be taken by the compete team on the project. That means a project manager, a person who's selling, the top management, they all are equally empowered in terms of guiding the clients. Uh, in terms of uh, the kind of um, shift in form that we are seeing in terms of types of research which is happening in the market, I'll take a moment on that also, because we talked measurement, and we talked about getting consumers from Meta to Mela. I think you were giving gems uh, there, Sapan. And that's become very imperative because for us, it's become more about outcome over output. So imagine uh, once upon a time, we'll do like campaign evaluations. You've won so much of impressions on one campaign. But if today one of my, say, active year brand is pumping in uh, 3 million unique ads, there is no way we can look at brand recall and the matrix the way we used to. It will be more about has my positioning shifted in that much you know, time? <clears throat> has my imagery? being called upon, not necessarily the funnel. So I've seen that shift that most of our clients have uh, gotten used to outcome over output. Uh, secondly, one would believe that post-pandemic era research will become ad hoc and we do like dipsticks once in a while, but always on community research is the future. You always have to be connected to the consumers and we are seeing a huge uplift in continuous work by clients where uh, by brands where we are having continuous consumer connects. We are always looking for what are the white spaces. We are always having, um, say in case of content, changes to scripts, changing to changes to episodes. This is what's happening um, on ground. The last piece um, I would say also is that in terms of uh, agile research, apart from always on, behavioral uh, studies uh, are also coming to play. So less dependency on a lot of claim data, more dependency on what the uh, system A and system B interactions are in terms of research. 
that is also to call. So I feel that this is a great opportunity for our sector uh, because for agile marketers, you really have to tweak down the spirit animal of uh, vanity research to something useful and actionable uh, because that's what the brands are looking for today. Thank you, and I think that's quite a fresh perspective from a research standpoint. <laughs> Uh, it'll be unfair to talk I about. Just add, I just want to add one thing here, you know, and I was speaking with Isha before that yeah. this quick research, you know, uh, is the order of the day and becomes very handy, and especially for a product like us where we are making the product every day. Yeah. This kind of feedback is really helpful because then you can implement changes. Yeah, and I was telling, I said, Mere ko bata do na ek hafte mein mera content chal raha hai, nahi chal raha hai. And she said, yeah, we do that these days. Because that's what the requirement is, and especially for brands like us. And you know, just to add in on that, we used to do these segmentation studies, which used to be the outcome for which might actually be uh, relevant for say two months, three months, or sometimes we used to have segmentation studies where we are looking at the segments for four years. And I've seen a drastic shift because pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, the stability of these segments have changed. We don't get studies on that frequency now. It's actually micro segments. Yeah, I and think a lot of times, a lot of times, you know, Sorry. Go ahead. Go on. No, I'm saying in real time data, right? I mean, to say measurement is so important. Once upon a time, my campaigns, I said, okay, my brand track metrics will shift. Tom spawns considerations. Then it came to online track. Now people don't have time for online on track. track. I have to check my scores every, okay, at least a week to see yeah. how it happens. I mean, say so it is that agility, not only in execution, it's also in measurement. So I mean to say, like, in a startup, right, you tell investors that, okay, my Tom's font will increase, and they say, okay, in how long? Like, can you show me results in a week? So we actually have surrogate metrics to see even equity scores uh, in addition to traffic and ROAS on a weekly basis. Wow. You are very important, you know, because, like, we also have an ongoing track, and I was telling Isha some time back that uh, by the time the results and the reports of the track come to us, a lot of times our shows have shut. So they'll say, this show is very good for your brand equity. Rates very high on your scores, and we say, Sorry, boss, this show is not going So, you know, that's the requirement of agility because you need to take quick action. That's what is. I think that's what differentiates Nepa as a research company because you guys are uh, not a post campaign, but while a campaign is ongoing, you're like providing solutions. Yeah. So, you can actually apply that and get benefits of it while that particular campaign is ongoing. Awesome. So, I think now that we've touched base about agile marketing from a consumer point of view, uh, it'll be unfair to discuss agile marketing without we understand how is it important to have internal stakeholder support without which it's not possible to adapt to agile marketing keeping in mind your consumer requirements right um harish i'm going to direct this question to you on linkedin you call yourself a serial entrepreneur <laughs> we've seen you play a crucial role in growing multiple businesses including your current uh, company which is mirim india so if you could just share your expertise or a piece of advice to all of us, how being in the leadership position, you can cultivate a agile mindset for your team and encourage them to adopt a marketing approach. Yeah, thanks. That, that, that's an interesting question, you know. So we, we all seem to agree that agile marketing is the way we need to behave. But how do you change an organization's mindset from doing things in a certain way to doing in a different fashion? And let me give you an example of something we are doing for a very uh, large global brand. You know, we do creative work, media work, production work, CRM work, everything for them. And it's a global brand. Uh, a couple of years back, we set up an agile pod for the organization. Now, what is an agile pod? An agile pod comprises of resources from like a copywriter, a designer, an HTML programmer, a creative technologist, a brand strategist. This becomes like an agile pod. And the agile pod is run by a scrum master. Okay, we, we borrow this term from from the technology side of the business. What is a Scrum Master's job? His job is to keep on throwing challenges to the Agile pod and seeing how they can come up with solutions. So this Scrum Master runs three week long sprints with the Agile pod. He goes and identifies challenges. From where do you identify challenges? When you speak to brand managers globally, they keep on telling you that this communication is a problem. It's not working for me. Or how do I make this happen from the communication book? Or he goes and looks at campaigns that are going on to see which campaigns are not performing. Or the person pick, picks up new innovation. I mean, chat GPT has come, right? We all know it's a brilliant thing. But how do I use it in my marketing? So he identifies these kind of challenges, creates three-week sprint. In that sprint, the challenge is thrown to this team of five, six people. And these people don't need to be like dedicated resources. You can have 50% of a copywriter, 25% of a strategist. That's how the team is comprised. 
in this three week period, that team will come up with different kind of solutions what to do. They will do test runs, they will try it out, what works well, they will institutionalize it across the organization. And what doesn't work well, you throw it out of the window. So say for example, one problem given to the team was how to use chat GPT. So they started looking at all kinds of content. They figured that for this kind of content, chat GPT is okay. It kind of serves the purpose. But for this content, it does not. And once that happens, a process put into place, so everybody across the company actually starts using the solution. They ran another experiment using Metaverse. They figured, as a brand, there is nothing we can do in Metaverse. Out of the window. So every three weeks, keep identifying something new, keep working on it, keep making the changes, and keep putting it back in the organization. That's how we bring in the agile mindset. So, so, you, so fair to say that you think testing constantly and a more sprint approach would be the way forward? Uh, absolutely. I believe the concept of agile marketing comes from agile software development. Sure. We should do waterfall development yeah. where you would build everything and then the customers would say, this was not you know? But if you keep on getting the customers buying in shorter cycles, you know exactly what you are creating is going to create value for the stakeholders who need to do it. So at a, at a company level, you need to create these kind of agile pods who can bring in that thinking. So it's literally like, like, like changing the wheels of a train while in motion. You can't change the entire train. But you can start working on it bit by bit. Thank you. I think that's a good perspective. And um, it really helps when the leadership comes with that mindset. Uh, but there are instances where we all have to balance, playing a balancing role, right? There are requirements of change ever, ever constantly from the consumers. But at the same time, we are also in situations where it's important to balance it with the internal stakeholder requirements. Uh, so just trying to understand how can one balance this role and get your teams to understand the requirement of agility and adopt it internally. Uh, Jaya, do you think you want to take this? First of all, thank you. You've made my job and answer much simpler. Uh, just picture this, okay? Castrol in India is about 130-year-old brand, uh, iconic brand, but it also means that they have uh, people who have worked in a certain style and fashion, and which which is the traditional FMCG automotive style of working, where you do seasonal campaigns and cyclic marketing and all of that. Also, picture this that you have a sales force uh, spread across the country, which is kind of I don't know, 1,000, 1,200 plus people in the, in the ground. And picture this, that we are a product which you cannot develop overnight just by looking at trends because it needs testing. Some of our products are in fact tested on Mars. Some of them are tested underwater. So what do you do, right? Uh, and, and then you see when you, when you meet your colleagues and ex-colleagues, you're like, are you guys going agile? And you suddenly feel like a rock. You're like, where are we and what are we doing? Uh, but luckily, uh, Castrol is part of uh, BP, British Petroleum, which is also a global organization, and we got a young, dynamic CEO who comes in and says, we will all go agile. Now, there are two kinds of people. One set who is going all helter-skelter, trying to understand exactly what we heard, what is a scrum master, what is a stand me standing meeting. Uh, technology is saying, how do you expect us to develop a product in four weeks? It's a year long, what do we test? How do we put it in the market? and the risks are high, and we are a listed entity. So we cannot, we cannot just go ahead and do whatever we like and say tomorrow we'll undo what we've done. Uh, I think three things when I reflect on the journey. One is really, uh, literally getting the organization, not just the marketing team, to adopt Agile. So at Castrol, we don't do only Agile marketing, we do Agile ways of working, which means we don't have project managers anymore, we have Scrum Master and we have product owners, right? And we do standing meeting. There are, I think, three things that, that I feel when I reflected on this question. I think the first piece is bite only what you can chew, okay? Don't, don't look at large campaigns, don't look at massive launches. They probably need another cycle and traditional way of working. But try and take small chews that you can, and what does that mean? It means that if we know that there are seven, eight, 10 lakh mechanics in India and we want to go and launch an app for them because now they are all digital, they are all sort of creating their own content also. Uh, the ambitious marketer in me would say, okay, let's go launch a full-fledged app. It should have training, it should have transactions, it should have everything, right? But the agile marketer would tell me, no, let's first go bite-sized. COVID has hit, they are all sitting free, they don't have work. Let's try and get them basic training which for which they have time. Let's try and get them business, which means you do demand generation on that app. And once they start adopting the technology and start seeing benefit in it, that's when you sort of get your transaction. So today, 
We have about seven and a half lakh mechanics with whom we transact directly, and that's a fantastic relationship you built. So that's being, that's to my mind first side, and I'm going to take some more time, yeah? <laughs> the second piece is about MVP, and I think everybody mentioned that. Um, even though we are an engine oil brand, there are certain things that you can pilot and test, and I think the product idea is what we also do. We, we, we thought of a certain set of site of product for bikes, and we said, okay, we don't have time to test, put it in a market, see if it works. 50% of the products worked, 50 didn't, right? And then we launched this set of auto care range, which is not the engine products, but things that you use on top of your bike to take care of your bike. How do you learn in that process? I think the <clears throat> third piece, very important for a retail organization and widely distributed product like us is empowering the sales guys. Because what happens is customer needs are changing every day. And with people having more access to information, and especially in a category like us where electrification and mobility and all of that is changing very fast, Specific customers have specific requirements, right? So Castrol has 25,000 odd workshops in the country. Not all workshops require the same. Um, Bombay workshops, for example, say there's electrification happening and we need solutions. So what you do is you form a process in place which allows you to empower your sales guys, saying, okay, within this budget, within these creative guidelines, you go ahead and do whatever you want to do as long as it fits into the process that's put in place. I think the fourth piece is about culture and all of us agree. It needs to come top down, yeah? And a lot of people need to be told it's okay. If you will fail, it's fine, we have your back. Put a process in place so that your risk is mitigated and when you sit in front of the board, the board is not making your life uncomfortable, saying how, how could you go and launch a product without testing it for X many hours? And I think the third piece is being able to put money behind agil agility. So it cannot be a buzzword. But you need to be able to go back to your top management or whoever your stakeholders are to say that by going agile and by adopting this new change, I have been able to show X million dollars, 100,000, whatever dollars, savings and benefits to the company, which was then when you will get a lot of buy-in and a lot of training and everything that you need to make that agile engine move in the organization. So I think having a building a successful case study and showing them the merit of it versus not doing it, right? The cost of doing it versus not doing it. Could I just add, uh, <clears throat> please? I think, Jaya, you made a very valid point about bite off only what you can chew. And I think one thing in my experience has been the really large decisions, let's face it, we are not ready to be completely agile yet. So <clears throat> as MasterCard, we sponsored, we took up a huge sponsorship of the BCCI, Home Cricket Series, the single largest sponsorship in a single country in the world. I've had to explain to at least 15 non-Indians what cricket means to this country. And there was nothing agile about that, let me tell you. Uh, but once we got it, then we said, okay, within each match, you know, because you can't predict the outcome, are we going to win, is Australia going to win, et cetera. Within that, how agile can the team be? And I think as marketing leaders, it's our job to manage the ecosystem, and we all have it, whether it's investors, whether it's senior management, Indian companies, multinational companies. But I think that's the real value you can add to ensure that your team can move with speed, you know, just given the constraints of business and reputation and all of it. That makes sense. Yeah, actually, you know, when we talk of agile marketing, I think what is most important is empowerment. You need to empower your team to be agile. Otherwise, if you are stuck in layers and layers and layers, then there cannot be agility. So empowerment for me is key for agile marketing. And that's why, like I said, right, it's, it's unfair to talk about agile marketing just one side from the customer centric, but it's also important that we empower our internal stakeholders. Fab, I don't think we could have had a more diverse uh, panel point of view on agile marketing. Uh, quickly, before we wrap up today's session, guys, in a quick one-liner for our audiences as a takeaway, what benefit would adopting an agile mindset bring to a company? We can start with you, Harish. Uh, pr probably getting you more success and m making you closer to your uh, customers. Great. Vanda? Agility will give you more revenue. <laughs> In addition to all this, it'll make marketing more fun. Yeah. It'll give you an edge over your competitor. Yes, I think spe speed of execution and room for failures will help organization learn also a lot more about what to do next. Acquire and retain young talent. Quite a relevant point. That's what I was just about to say. <laughs> but I also think it will just uh, make stronger communities. Quick. Technology for, I would say, insights, real-time insights, and it's, it's not an insight if it's not actionable. 
Super. So thank you so much to all our panelists. And I think uh, today's session should help you plan your 2023 better. And yeah, that's it from us. Thank you. Thank you.